Will, welcome. Here we are at the end of our trip through 1 Corinthians, and we're in the penultimate chapter, 15 out of 16, and it really is the conclusion, what it's all been building to. And accordingly, what it's all been building toward is end things, <laughs> which is death, but more than death. And this is what Paul really dives into. And on account of Christ, who is the Alpha and the Omega, in whom is not just your beginning and your end, but eternity itself, things get topsy-turvy. And the truth is, in this topsy-turvy world, that's not so bad. In fact, um, Christ's ways are level and smooth. But first, there's a bit of disorientation. But on the other side of that is 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 the joy of new life and that's on the threshold that you actually just stand on the other side of already and this service aims to um, push you into the fullness thereof so may that happen and to prepare for it, some time of uh, reflection and prayer and deep breaths to get ready so blessings on all that may you experience it and more A reading from St. Paul's first epistle to the church in Corinth, chapter 15. Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain and your faith has been in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified of God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if this is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sin. Then those also who have died in Christ have perished. For at this life only we have hope in Christ. We are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. For since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead has also come through a human being. For as all die in Adam, so all will be made, made alive in Christ. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. 
Then comes the end, when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed every ruler and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjugation under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjugation, it is plain that this does not include the one who put all things in subjugation under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to the one who put all things in subjection under him, so that God may be all in all. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks be to God. One of the very first lessons they teach you in journalism school is how to write an obituary. <laughs> yes, you heard that right, an obituary. And while it might be a little surprising, it actually makes a lot of sense. After all, a, a traditional obituary is just straight ahead reporting. <laughs> Those old, print, those old print obituaries, it was only the facts that were published. The conventional obituary is limited to information such as the person's name, their age, and this is important, their cause of death. I can still remember Blessed Rose Codet shouting, the person did not pass away. They did not go on to their reward. No, they died. To be a good reporter, insisted Rose, you had to be able to tell the plain truth. The plain truth. I doubt that was my first lesson in truth-telling, but it was the one that stuck. And as I've served as a pastor, I've always thought that we, as the church, should be able to be at least as honest as the newspaper, right? But it's hard, isn't it? We don't like to talk about death. And we've concocted all these euphemisms to talk around that unhappy reality. The technical term for this is circumlocution. Uh, locution as in talk, and circum as in around, like circumnavigate. We use circumlocutions to talk around unpleasantries. And on that note, Maybe you're getting a little antsy with all this candid talk about death. Perhaps you wish I'd stop tossing the word around so casually. For all I know, you're hoping that I change the topic altogether. But you know what? You know what? Language is powerful, and being able to name something gives you a handle on it. That's why diagnoses are so important. Identifying an illness is the first step in treating it. And that's what's happening in Eden, too. God parading all the animals before Adam to name is part of the dominion God grants humankind. In fact, description is that instrument Margot Robbie wields in that surprisingly theological film, Barbie. <laughs> the truth is, honest speech is just good speech. And I don't mean good as in a quality, I mean good as in an effect. Now, honest speech is, is good in the quality. I mean, honest speech is better than careless prattle, but there's more to it than that. In fact, honest speech is good in that it is good to hear. That's what our Stephen ministers learned. Our Stephen ministers, and these are people who are trained to, to walk with you when you're going through a tough time on more regular intervals than the pastor. And so if that's something that you're interested in, just reach out to us and, and we can get you set up with a Stephen minister. They're trained to walk with us in those tough times. But our Stephen ministers, as part of their training, were trained to say the word death. And the reason they were taught to do so is because it's caring to acknowledge a person's reality. We do grieving people no favors by being so uncomfortable that we can't even say the word death. By our circumlocutions, our euphemisms, we implicitly tell people that they cannot talk about that valley of the shadow of death they're trudging through. And that terrible silence makes the grief that much more difficult to bear. 
So let's be clear, if you want to be there for someone, all you have to do is show up. And then it's merely a matter of letting your discomfort be the welcome mat to their healing, because it is. <laughs> In fact, that experience will even serve as fortification for your own faith, because it is. Stepping into your own apprehension is the first step into that promised land of faith. And what's more, walking with someone as the Holy Spirit rises them up out of the rubble of death will make an honest-to-goodness Christian out of you twice over. And believe me, I've experienced this myself. Better than all that, though, is the fact that you can do all that. You really can. Uh, you can play fast and loose with your misgivings, and you can do so, you can do so for a couple of reasons. First of all, because that old you that runs at the first sight of the last enemy is already as good as dead. <laughs> the old you that lives in constant fear has never lived a single day of life, at least not a real one. More importantly, though, you, you no longer live to that old you in you. There are two yous in you, you understand. There is that old creature, the one that wants to live by its own wiles, and that creature will never live. It will never live because it will always be too busy hiding from the next threat to ever really risk life. However, by baptism, there is another you to you. And if you're not baptized, just get a hold of us. But you see, this new creature that lives in you truly lives, and that is the new Adam or the new Eve in you. And this new creature is raised up from the corpse of the old you every time. And this new you in you lives, not by its own designs, but faith. Faith. <laughs> As such, that new creature really lives. In fact, that new creature in you is so alive that it will stake its life for another a thousand times over. The new you in you is so bursting with vitality that it is not afraid to look death square in the eye. And that's a good thing. It's a good thing because guess what? Death is not as scary as it looks. In fact, now death is a sorry sight. Death has been dealt a death blow. Christ's resurrection, you ought to know, did not, uh, did not affect Christ alone. Why, nothing could be further from the truth. In all truth, Christ's resurrection had cosmic repercussions. Christ, by his resurrection, has wounded death onto death. Yes, death may still wreak havoc, but that is nothing more than the fit of a defeated despot. Death does all the damage it can now because death's days have been numbered. And now, it is only a matter of time. Moreover, in Christ, the Alpha and the Omega, the time has grown short. Christ is not sitting up in heaven twiddling his thumbs, you know. No, Christ is even now tying up death. In fact, by these words and your subsequent faith, Christ is doing death dirty one more time. So say the word. Trample your uneasiness in that old foe, too. Isn't that what Dumbledore taught Harry to do to defeat Voldemort? And you'll be interested to learn, by the way, that mort in Voldemort comes from the word for death, the French word for death. But anyway, let's do it, shall we? Let's exercise a little power. On the count of three, let's, let's say death together, okay? And remember, you're not alone, <laughs> because even if you're doing this service by yourself, you're not alone. Because by these words, the Holy Spirit saddles up right next to you. And, and actually, it's the Holy Spirit who, who uh, flexes some muscle in this exercise, all right? So here we go. On the count of three. One, two, three. Say it. Death. There. Now, hopefully, that word has lost a little of its power. Because in Christ, death has lost all its power. All its ultimate power. In other words, death is no longer deadly. You know what, though? And this might surprise you, but Paul himself reverts to a little of this talking around I mentioned earlier. This is lost in translation, but when Paul talks about death, he doesn't say the actual word. No, he uses a euphemism. It was, of all people, the Corinthians who were using the word death 
When Paul quotes their position, he says the resurrection of the dead. And that's the technical term, necron, dead. But when Paul speaks for himself, he applies a metaphor, fallen asleep. In fact, you can kind of hear this in our translation. When our scripture reads resurrection of the dead, that's what the Corinthians were saying. But when it says died, that's what Paul said. Only Paul didn't say died. No, what Paul literally, literally said was fallen asleep. A common Greek colloquialism. And that difference, it captures all the difference between St. Paul and the Corinthians. You might remember that the Corinthians desired, above all else, to be refined in all manner of things. The Corinthians were anxious to exhibit their wealth, and they were all too happy to demonstrate their intellect, too. As such, they had misgivings when it came to the odd matter of the resurrection of the dead. The Corinthians were not interested in superstition. They wanted to look at the world with unvarnished clarity. Uh, They could handle it, they were sure. Accordingly, to the Corinthians' ears, the resurrection of the dead sounded like a bunch of hooey. Perhaps the Corinthians uh, interpreted the resurrection of the dead as an an analogy for the immortality of the soul. Or maybe they held to a realized eschatology. In other words, uh, maybe the Corinthians considered them practitioners of a sort of resurrection life, as it were. We can't be sure. What we can be sure of, though, is that the Corinthians were not impressed when it came to the resurrection of the dead. Paul's insistence on the rising of physical bodies struck the Corinthians as altogether crude. And the Corinthians, for their part, were urbane. Uh, They fancied themselves astute enough to conclude that when a body is buried, that's that. Christ, they deduced, was for the here and now. Christ could help you lead a good life, and presumably he could even assist in accommodating yourself to the cold, hard facts. But beyond that, well, there's just nothing to be done beyond that. St. Paul, though, for his part, considered, uh, considered all the Corinthians' so-called f- sophistication just a bunch of pious godlessness. In fact, as far as Paul can tell, it's the Corinthians, not him, who are being naive. Furthermore, if anyone blanched in the face of death, it was the Corinthians. In point of fact, Paul does use the technical term for death, and as a matter of fact, he does so just three short verses after our passage. I die daily, Paul says, and the word he uses is necron, dead. St. Paul isn't afraid to say the word death. He's just not about to use it prematurely. It's not that the terrible word sticks in Paul's throat. It's that now, on account of Christ, death is no longer all that deadly. In Christ, fallen asleep is now the most accurate term to describe what happens when we biologically die. On account of Christ and his resurrection, death now turns out to be nothing more than a little nap. And let's be honest, you and I, we could all use a little nap, couldn't we? I know I could. You might remember that Jesus himself used the very same term, too. When Jesus was told that Lazarus had died, Jesus replied his friend had merely fallen asleep. And then when uh, Jairus, the leader of, uh, a, leader, a leader of the synagogue, told Jesus that he didn't need to bother coming to heal his daughter because she had died while Jesus was en route, Jesus replied that the child was not dead but sleeping. Both these responses occasioned confusion and even outright derision. However, after Jesus raised both of them from the dead, no one was laughing anymore. Or more accurately, now they were really laughing. <laughs> Uh, Their mourning had turned to joy. Christ was right, wasn't he? The dead are just sleeping. This, by the way, is why we put R.I.P. on tombstones. Rest in peace. Rest. In Christ, all those laid to rest in the hope of the resurrection are doing just that, merely resting. In light of the resurrection, death is now nothing more than a pit stop on the way to life eternal. And in the meantime... In the meantime, the death that really matters is the one that comes before our hearts stop beating and the neurons in our brain cease to fire. Uh, In other words, I'm talking about the kind of death that Paul dies daily, the death of the old creature, the death of that old Adam and Eve that clutches its own sad approximation of life with a death grip that kills everything it comes into contact with, including itself. The Corinthians thought they were hard-boiled realists, but really they were just a bunch of fraidy cats. 
they ran every time death stepped on the scene. And Paul could tell. Paul could tell because if the Corinthians had ever dared to look in their tomb, they would have found, they would have found that it was perfectly empty. The Corinthians assumed, and we all know what happens when you assume, but anyway, the Corinthians assumed that when death stepped on the scene, that was curtains. And in a way, it was, but not curtains closing. No, uh, curtains opening. Whenever death steps on the scene, it's really opening curtain, opening curtain on eternity, opening curtain on the life that really is life. But the Corinthians never saw that. And they never saw that because they were always too afraid to look. The Corinthians averted their gaze every time death stepped on the scene. And as such, they, they missed the show. And oh, what a show it is. It's a pity the Corinthians never brought themselves to really take a cold, hard look at death. But it's not a pity in that they chickened out. It's a pity in the truest sense of the word. The pity of it all is that the Corinthians never really lived. In granting death a place of finality, the Corinthians conceded the horizons of their life to death. As such, they never really experienced the real thing. In this series, we've been calling it a self-continuity project, but you could just as well call it a corpse management plan. Either way, it all boils down to a scheme to manage your own death. Because so long as death defines the program, your life will always be nothing more than a a never-ending series of attempts to forestall that eternal skunk. And while there may be a time and place for that, it's a sorry excuse for the real deal. To have no greater goal than evading the next threat is to never really experience what makes life worth living. Sisters and brothers, Christ has come that you might have life and have it abundantly. Uh, Christ hasn't saved you just to leave you in the lurch. No, he saved you to really set you free. And if the Son of Man sets you free, you shall be free indeed. Christ has pulled you to the far side of death. You no longer live with death ahead of you. No, now it is forever behind you in your rearview mirror. And the life you now live is hidden in Christ with the eternity he always brings along with him. Your death and life in that order, your death and life in that order is lived by faith in the Son of God. And that means the source of your life is outside of yourself. The source of your life is where faith is found. The source of your life is Christ Jesus himself. You do not live to yourself anymore. No, now your life, your life is lived in Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus who lives in and among, and through you. Yes, you. Christ did not circumnavigate death. He didn't go around it. No, he went right through it. Uh, Christ went right through that final foe. And when death did its worst, Christ didn't blink. No, he he rode that beast all the way down to the abysmal end. And there, right where death's furious futility was finally and fully unleashed, Christ planted his flag of victory. So now, when you find yourself there, because we all do, don't we? But anyway, when you find yourself at ground zero for the chaos and destruction of death, you will actually be on holy ground, that firm foundation where faith is found every time. And the new you that walks away from that collision, because you will, will be a truly new you. A new you who holds life loosely. A new you that loves more fiercely. A new you that dares to risk it all. And a new you that, even when the cards don't come out in your favor, doesn't lose faith either. We all know death doesn't just cease to exist anymore, don't we? The mystery of it, though, is that now the side of death is precisely where Christ brings his victory to bear. Now, death is where eternity springs forth. Now death is where you come to capital L life to all that. Yes, death may have overstayed its welcome, but now death has lost its sting. When Christ rose from the grave, he knocked out all death's teeth and death no longer has a bite. And that's right where you and I find our voice. And so, let us give that new creature in us full reign for a little bit. Eh, that sounds good, doesn't it? I know it does to me. And so what we're going to do is some time of prayer. That's one of the best ways of letting that new creature in you talk. And later on, we'll sing a hymn of victory too. And that's a great way to do it as well. So, 
for now, a little bit of time just to take all that in because it is all yours. And so now, be of good courage, hold fast to that which is good, render to no one evil for evil, strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the afflicted, honor all people, love and serve God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And now that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to rejoice in the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, please join us in singing our hymn.
and so now receive your blessing. The Lord bless and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. And all of God's children say, Amen. Amen. And so now we conclude our worship with that, that, that wonderful prayer that um, holds all things together. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And so before we conclude, just a, a few announcements. It's, it's the fall now, so we got Sunday school going on before, before Sunday morning worship at 10 a.m. Sunday school starts around uh, 9 15, I believe. Uh, double check with the church to make sure I got that right. Uh, we also have an adult Bible study before worship, too, starting around 9 15. We got confirmation going on Wednesday nights, and uh, we got a book group going, too. And I'm sure there's other things that I'm forgetting. We're always got some collection going on or some activity, uh, fun activity planned. And the best way to stay up to date on that is just to be in touch with us. We send out an email every week on Friday that's got a link to this service and um, our updated announcements, and so you could contact the office to receive those. You could check out our website. You could um, shoot us an email or send us uh, a Facebook message, or you could give us a call. All of, after this, it'll have our website where you can get all of our contact information. Or a really great way, if you're comfortable, is to join us for worship here um, at Faith Lutheran on Sunnyside on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m., where the good Lord gathers us all up together. And since the Lord makes no distinctions, neither do we all indeed are welcome. But those are all of our announcements for the time being. And so now, go in peace, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs>